Give Mark time to get his coffee. that's going on. You know, uh, Brian's mother-in-law, um, keep her in our prayers. Jared and Whitney, for them to do. That's right. Um, we come in the day, uh, middle of Feb uh, February. Pray for Mr. Sam. Ms. Bobby and I don't see Ms. Bobby this morning. Yeah, yeah. I think the plan is that, well, I shouldn't say the same time. Sure, okay. He didn't want a candidate for targeted therapy, so there's an option of low dose chemo to try to extend So okay. definitely pray for him. Well, Anything Lisa, else we can bring up? Sorry. Lisa, we couldn't hear that on this end. Is this your, about your dad? Mm -hmm. What about it? I think they're going to try the low-dose chemotherapy for a while to try to buy them a little time. The target therapy wasn't an option, so uh, they kind of got some time frames and things. I don't know if they're sharing them yet, but definitely thankful. Yeah. Anything else? I know we'll have some more updates uh, when uh, we get to worship together. I know uh, Bill will have those, but uh, thanks for sharing any of them as we start off here uh, for our morning. All right, that's everything. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you grateful to be here today together as a family. And it's a special day to be able to worship you, to remember your son that was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. We're also grateful that as brothers and sisters, we get to uh, share things together. We get to share burdens and, and also joy and to be able to lift things up uh, to you and to one another. And you're very aware of these situations that we've talked about I pray that you will answer uh, our request according to your will. But please take them into consideration. If there's anything that we haven't mentioned out loud, you know what's going on in our lives and the things that we say to you privately. But I just pray that you'll continue to bless the church here. Um, be with all of our elders and uh, deacons and ministers and members, all of us as we're just working together in your kingdom. Be with us as we study your word. Help us to have a knowledge of the truth that we may share it with other people. We love you so much. Praise to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as we are continuing um, looking at special topics, we uh, came through the majority of the book, actually covered the whole book in multiple waves. Um, starting last week, we started getting to these, what I'm calling special topics, um, issues that people have as they are working through the book of Romans. And one of the things that we established very early on, I was just talking to David about this, is that, you know, even Peter the Apostle in his letter, he says, look, people take things that Paul has written. Uh, some of them are hard to understand, but we can work through them. And I think that's the great thing about Scripture is that it gives itself its own commentary. So any things that we talk about, of course, we're going to be pulling in other passages. And if you haven't figured out yet, Ephesians and Galatians and some of Colossians work right into what we're talking about with Romans. And uh, the topic that we're going to be covering today is the topic of flesh and spirit. And so... You know, a lot of different ways that we can handle this. We're going to sit down mostly in chapter 7 and chapter 8 to figure out what's going on. We'll kind of see where this goes from here. Um, next week, I'm going to be gone. We're taking our college retreat um, to North Alabama. We're Fulton University and our college ministry here and university, we're working together. But Fulton University is also meeting up with Freed Hardeman. And we have like 100 people going, which is crazy. You know, last time it was like 40 folks. And now with everybody, it's 100. And so I appreciate the prayers on that. But I'll be gone Sunday morning. But... My whole intention today is just to stir things up and lob some things out there, and Brian's going to teach next week, so he gets to clean up if anything goes wrong. Um, so this is all going to be really strategic. If you have any questions at all, I'm going to write them down and put them on a slide, and that's what he's going to teach next week. So, um, now I think with this being, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways we can handle this topic of uh, flesh and spirit. Um, you know, I was thinking, all right, let's spend all of our time talking about the spirit and how Paul used that throughout his book, and that's going to be part of this. But also we want to understand what's going on when he talks about flesh um, and just the sin problem. And we'll kind of see where our discussion goes, and then we'll craft some other lessons beyond here, because I have a few of these special topics in light of that. One of them is going to be um, 
the, the idea of, uh, you know, Israel being hardened by sin. And, and maybe we'll spend some time talking about people's view of sin, you know, original sin, if that, if that. in the book of Romans, because he's going to start off with you know, Adam, compare him to Christ, what Christ has done, what Adam started, and all this kind of stuff. So um, I've got a self-contained lesson that's going to deal with that topic a little bit more in depth. So the stuff that we deal with today with flesh, we'll kind of see if it'll go down that track. And then with the Spirit, if we need to spend some more time on that, we definitely can. So I, I pulled in other information to make it as beneficial as possible. So as we dive in, just know there are more options where this can go. Um, and just kind of see what happens beyond that. But let's open up. I think we're going to be spending most of our time, but not all of our time, in uh, Romans 7 and 8. Um, kind of as we're working through, uh, we've gone little by little in each chapter. Um, but somebody read Romans 5, 3 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So um, if you do a quick word search of just the word spirit or flesh throughout the Romans, you're going to see a ton of verses. This is not going to be the first reference to the spirit, um, but this is a first major explanation about what God is doing, and then that's going to be expounded on in chapters 7 and 8. 6 kind of takes a little excursus to talk about uh, our combat with sin. And like I said, that, that could be a topic in and of itself. But I like what Paul structures here. He's given us this compound characteristics that he does at times, and he builds one thing on top of the other one. So knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Hope does not put us to shame. Does that sound familiar? Um, can you think of any other passages that kind of have a similar build to them like that? Maybe just by way of a reference if some of them come to mind. James chapter 1 or 2. Okay, so uh, James Okay, so James is going to do some of that. Yeah, so James chapter, uh, yeah, James chapter 1, um, he starts talking about rejoicing and suffering. Um, yeah, and so suffering, if you can work through that, you're going to be uh, benefited because of this and this and this. So starting noticing compounding characteristics in Christianity. This is going to be very important about growth and going from flesh to spirit. There's going to be uh, a process and compounding, okay? Um, any other ones that come to mind? There's one passage, um, and I don't know if it would come to anybody's mind or to reference it, but in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 5, it says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. You just have to read those verses fast. It just makes it more fun that way. Um, but that's 2 Peter chapter 1, that uh, you get this compound of you start with faith. You've got to begin somewhere. Um, and knowing that our faith is going to have suffering attached to it. it makes me think about the Sermon on the Mount. Starting in chapter 5, Paul, uh, excuse me, Jesus begins with the Beatitudes, right? So he talks about poor in spirit, um, uh, meek, all this kind of stuff. But he gets to the end, and he's, he, he's talking about blessed are those, blessed are them. It's these individuals over here until you get to, was it like verse 11, where he shifts. He said, blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. For no, they did this to the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is even saying, he's like, all right, if you can pass through these characteristics, the Beatitudes, and you're all in, you're going to live the Christian life, just know persecutions are going to come. And so that's why he's like, he's given us this introduction. He said, those are these things you should be building for. And if you're ready to sign on, you say, that's the kind of life I want to live. Blessed are you when others revile you. It's coming. And so Paul, all throughout his book, and really every time that he writes, he's trying to give us hope knowing that you got to start somewhere, and it's going to have growing pains. Um, you got that you have to work through individually, but also other people's. If you're coming out of the world into Christ, you're leaving an old life behind, and you're pursuing something new. It's going to confuse people. They can't figure out why did you used to do this kind of stuff, or why are you not doing it anymore? Why are you not hanging out with me? Why are you not dating this person? Why are you not doing that? Why is your marriage, your job, all this kind of stuff? Why has it, you know, changed? What looks different there? 
And you get to the end, and this is where it's going to be important for our discussion of just this flesh and spirit and see, um, you know, why are they opposed to each other? How do, they, how do they operate together? How does God respond to them? He says, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Um, God has equipped us, given us what we need to be able to pursue his teachings, to pursue the life that he has designed. Um, We've seen it from the very beginning. God's activity in the world, his spirit that was present at creation and all the way through, he has been with his people. You see the Trinity present from the very beginning all the way through Jesus and then working through the apostles and uh, giving us encouragement even 2,000 years past the apostles themselves. So let's hold this kind of idea in our mind, knowing that the flesh and the spirit discussion that we're going to have is going to be about growth and resolve. So that's why we're going to be thinking about these a little bit more extensively. Now, as you continue on in Romans chapter 5, anytime you have a question or comment, go ahead and jump in. If other verses come to mind, uh, just kind of take them and roll along with it. But as you continue in Romans chapter 5, our key verse for the whole chapter. So, you know, we went chapter by chapter, picked a particular verse. I picked verse 10 as the key. Somebody read this. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? All right, so Paul's argument, first three chapters deals with sin. Chapter four, he starts a conversation about righteousness. And we know that the righteous shall live by faith. Righteousness of God has been given to us that we may pursue it. Righteousness with God himself. And so, as we think about this, at one time we were enemies, but now we are reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's the key. Once we were at odds, living in the flesh, living in darkness, all these other, uh, you know, figurative language and things that we can talk about. This was the lifestyle. That was the old man. But now we are something new in Christ. We are reconciled. We are brought back into balance with God. And because God has done this, and we talked about the living sacrifice in our application section, so Romans 12, that we are this living sacrifice of Jesus. Go along the way. So we're actually living a life in Christ, um, dedicated to him and God. So this is the beginning idea for where we're going in this discussion. And this is going to be expanded. But let's stop and compare and think for a little bit. He says, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled. What's going on here? Um, and I've got a slide a little bit later on about some other passages that share this idea, and it's fine if you pull them out now. What does this mean that at one time we were enemies, but now we're not? What comes to your mind, or what's going on there that we were once enemies? Partially parallel, a few verses above, <clears throat> sin separates us from God. Those part of sin cannot be a part of Him. I think you could apply the sin being once we are in sin, we were always enemies of God. Okay, so when sin is present, we are at odds with God. And in chapter five, and this is going to be maybe where we will begin in that other discussion, you're going to put Adam and Christ next to each other. What Adam began, you know, by sinning. Christ is going to resolve. And you can even go back to our timeline that we dealt with as well. Um, so sin has, from the very beginning, separated us from God. When sin came in, Adam got kicked out of his house. <laughs> and he, he no longer got to walk with God in the garden, and things were challenging from then on. Um, so sin makes us enemies with God, okay? Um, I heard another comment. I was just more or less okay. what David said there. Just Um, if we know that was the life, for those of us that have made the decision to be in Christ, we look back on that old life, hopefully, and say, I'm glad that I am so far removed from that. And not just, all right, Jesus has forgiven me of those sins, so the debt is cleared, and, and that's there. There should be distance between who we used to be and who we are now. Not just, you know, intellectually, I know that, you know, all right, he cleaned things, and that's fine, and I started over. But really, if you were to look at me, you know, I don't know how long you've been a Christian, um, but before you became a Christian, I don't know if you look back and you say, you know, five years, 
10 years ago, 25 years ago, um, that person looks drastically different from this one. There are times where we look back and we think, I don't know if I've really grown a ton in maybe this area from there, but I can see exponentially that I've grown here. You know, there, what has really changed from there to where I am today? And do we really believe wholeheartedly that God has really resolved that issue? And if he has given us the tools and he has actually resolved those things, this life should be drastically different. Um, so as Paul is going in his discussion, in chapter 5, he's introducing, you know, once again, this kind of battle that we've got. Chapter 6, he's going to give us actually the resolve. He says, you are in Christ, you are, not, you are united with him. But we're going to come to chapter 7 where you get this inside, you know, approach to how Paul feels as he is just battling with this difference of coming up out of sin and living the right kind of life. Um, and this is going to bleed over to chapter 8 where we'll get Seven is going to help us with understand the flesh, and eight is going to help us understand the spirit. So, uh, coming back to this, these were our key verses coming out of chapter seven. So, somebody read verse six and verse twenty-five. Now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in a new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. You read twenty-five too. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then. I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. All right, so I know it, you know, it's kind of unfair with reading the whole chapter, dropping in and picking verse 6, and then all the way to the end of verse 25. There's a lot of discussion, clearly, um, that's happening in the middle that we're going to look at. But the recurring theme from chapter 5 into chapter Moses had brought in, um, that was there, that's not where we're, we are hanging our salvation. All the promises from God actually began a lot earlier with what he was telling Abraham would be promised to his offspring, which is Jesus. So if we go with the promise that started here and then we come to Abraham, I mean, we started with Abraham, we come to Jesus, and now this is where the promises are enacted to us. This is where our hope is. It's not in that law although that was part of God's process bringing us to here. It was that guardian. So leading us so that when Jesus is standing in front of us, we can see him clearly and we can know that God very much expects the right kind of life from us. But it's not in the same old written code. That's been resolved. That's been fixed. That's been fulfilled. But we now walk in the new way of the Spirit. And what that looks like in Paul's battle with this is that it's through Jesus Christ, of course, but I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but the flesh I serve the law of sin. So one of the parts with Paul writing the book of Romans is how he used the word law and even spirit. Law can be something very generic, just God's commandments are law. So whether it's a law in the garden, don't touch this, don't eat this, don't go there, um, that is a law of God, that is a commandment. Now we can talk about the law. Um, capital L, you know, if we see it that way and we think about the law that was given to Moses. But if we're focusing on God's law overall or his plan, he, all, he has always had structure to our lives. But then there's also this idea, the law of sin. So we began with thinking about the flesh and that we've escaped the flesh. And as Paul's looking back on what the flesh has to offer, he brings us to this idea of the law of sin. Now, what in the world is going on here? to talk about the law of sin. What do you think? I think that the flesh is always in some ways going to be susceptible to the temptation of sin. You know, you're never going to fully be free from the possibility of, of going right back into that because your animal nature, your, your primal nature, the way you were sort of your humanity is always there underneath the surface and you know Paul saying with my mind I serve God I'm deciding I'm I'm making a, a conscious decision not to do what my flesh wants to do but it's there and it's you know it wants to serve you know itself in a lot of ways and that's really never going to go away that's why you have to constantly put it to death but I, it seems that that's kind of the tension there between what I know I should do and I'm going to do and I'm deciding to do versus 
what my natural instinct might be. Okay. So when we talk about law, there is structure. And to be able to give structure to sin and calling it what it is, that means there has to be some kind of pattern. So if we talk about the law of nature, you know, the law of gravity, stuff like this, there's dependability on it. So if we say sin operates in this way, can we trace down a history of how sin operates? Okay, I, I think uh, there's a lot there, but then this battle of I'm going to be in the flesh, and the flesh has its wants and its desires, and we need to be ready to combat that. Yes, sir? Paul also says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, at verse 14, he says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Or there's that struggle um, between your spiritual man and your natural man, which yep. is what Jeremy told me. That's right. And, and we're going to come back to this verse because I think if you jump up to verse 10 or 11, he tells us what the Spirit really is. He says, The Spirit is the mind of God. And just as you have your own personality and your own you know, in individuality and nobody knows your thoughts except for yourself, no one knows the thoughts of God except for God himself. But if he has revealed himself to us, we can know what he expects of us. So the natural man is going to see the mind of God and not live that way. But those that are spiritually minded, spiritually discerning, as in I want to think like God, are going to fall in line with that. It's going to be a paradigm shift. And so Paul's here changing his mind. And, and chapter 8 is going to be filled with this kind of language of changing our minds and setting that where it needs to go. But uh, excellent passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, very good section there. Okay, anything else come to mind with this law of sin? All right, let's see if we can fill in the middle here a little bit more. Building up to verse 6, let's back up to verse 4. Um, and i like y'all to read because I'm up here uh, talking the whole time, and it helps me out. So Somebody read Romans 7, um, and you can just do 4 and 5, but if you want to keep the pace and go to verse 6, you're welcome to. <clears throat> Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another. To him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in a new way, in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. So the way, and if you figure this out, and I, I love... Bibles that have a cross reference in them. I don't know what uh, translation you use or whatever. I use ESV and they have the center reference down the middle where you find a particular word in the passage and they'll give you other verses attached to it. Uh, a lot of Bibles have really taken those out. They might have some footnotes or commentaries at the bottom, but just connecting an idea or a teaching with other verses throughout Scripture. Um, I, I love translations that have this, and a lot of them are starting to remove them. But that's the way that I study. When I find a word in a passage, I want to know, has God taught on this before? Because nothing stands in a vacuum. It's always going to be reassured, and it's going to, be, uh, it's going to have another commentary elsewhere. And so maybe you can start seeing some of these ideas in other passages. And um, I'm going to have a lot of these mentioned on the next slide. But out of curiosity, which ones start sticking out to you? What about this? In order that we may bear fruit for God. What would that fruit be? Fruit of the Spirit. Okay, you got fruit of the Spirit. Um, I think about, you know, even early teachings with John the Baptist and Jesus bearing fruit with repentance, that that should look like something. And, and it's expounded on, right, with with Paul talking about the spirit, if you bear fruit for God, from there, you can see the mind of God lived out correctly. All right, um, you got bear fruit for God. Um, we're at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So think of those passages where you got fruit of the spirit, and then you got the what's the opposite? works of the flesh, right? And they're going to produce fruit. You can know a tree by its fruit. A good tree will produce good fruit. A bad tree will produce bad fruit. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit, nor can a good tree produce bad fruit. You're going to know a tree by its fruit. Jesus says that. So 
what kind of fruit are you bearing? Because you are. You're bearing fruit. They're looking at us, and they're saying, this is the kind of life that you are living. Does it look more like God, or does it look more like that old life? Or does it look like things that are the opposite of God? Maybe another, a couple other things. Five, for while we the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear that fruit for death. So, think about this. And uh, people really get caught up in chapter 7 thinking about the law and maybe it was bad that God would bring this in and why would he have all these restrictions. How is it that if at one point we're in the flesh, our sinful passions were aroused by the law? What in the world does that mean? I like discussion if you haven't figured this out. We like chewing into it and then I think Paul gives us an answer a little bit further on. But how would the law arouse passions? That almost sounds counterproductive, doesn't it? Just like it does in a kid, you need to tell them not to do something that they didn't know they weren't supposed to do. Now they want to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you know all the things that you shouldn't do, it is that much more appetizing. of like, I wonder why mom and dad said don't do that until after the fact. And you're like, oh, that's why. (laughs) You know, hopefully they will learn from there. Okay, so... um, these sinful passions, they are aroused, as in, if God says don't do something, curiosity, or just that rebellious idea in verses, uh, chapters 1 through 3 of, I want to go against this. I mean, there's that volitional aspect of, I just want to go against the law of God. But then, knowing that I can't go down this path, if it's there, why God? Why would you not want me to do that? So we start challenging it and questioning God instead of just submitting. And that's where chapter 6 that we uh, skipped over, where he says, are you presenting yourselves as instruments of righteousness or of sin? You're going to be enslaved to something. It's either going to be God or it's going to be sin. If you're enslaved to sin, you're always going to be challenging what God has said. So we got to then. So looking at this, and he's like, some of you are looking at the law. And maybe you're thinking, well, the law, you know, was it bad? Because, you know, it's arousing, um, you know, this kind of sin. What, what do we do with this? I, I think Jeremy's right on track. But we also have to understand how sin operates or how we operate with sin. Um, I, I got some verses we're going to come to on here, but I do not have this one uh, marked down. But go to James chapter 1, just to understand a little bit more about sin. If, if I've mentioned it once, I've probably mentioned it a, a few other times. But let's see if we can get it peg down a little bit more about how these desires work out. Uh, Somebody read James 1, uh, 14 and 15. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. All right, so you've got a process here. You've got desires lead to temptation, temptation leads to sin, sin leads to death. All right, so let's stop and consider this in a lot of what Jeremy was saying and just uh, bringing out that question altogether. Desires of the flesh, those are natural to who we are, right? We're created as beings with flesh. God made us sexual beings. God made us uh, industrious, productive individuals in his image. But we have desires. But you've got to keep those desires in check. If you just lived your life thinking, you know what, I'm just going to do whatever feels good. I mean, just true hedonism, right? Um, Can you see people who have lived that kind of lifestyle and they want to pursue that kind? Does it ever produce anything good? I I mean, in a worldly aspect, look at people who just want to fulfill their own personal passions. How fulfilled are they really? I'm going to, you know, I'm going to just pursue, um, you know, money or power or sex or any of these things. What does that end up producing? Nothing good. To illustrate that, read the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, he talks about vanity of vanities, all is vanity, a striving after the wind. Um, if you're just you know, trying to reach out and grab the wind, you're never going to get it. And the way I like how the, the book continues on from there is in chapter 2, starting in verse 1, he goes on this little bit of an adventure about the life that he wants to live. And he says in chapter 2, starting in verse 1, he pretty much says, I told my heart, you be my guide. He says, so I lived up that kind of life. Read through the uh, book of Ecclesiastes, he said, I pursued knowledge. Um, I, I, I got books. Um, I, I had relationships. I had jobs. I had, I had all of these kind of things. He said, you know, pursuing all that kind of stuff, it was nothing. You get to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, and how's that all wrap up? Uh, 
and fear God, and keep his commandments. What happened as, you know, he's going through this, this process of looking at things of the world and trying to fill it with, with this and this and this, there's always going to be a hole that's missing. That's what we think we're doing when we pursue sin, is that we're trying to fill a God-shaped hole that's in our lives that only God can fulfill. And that's the battle of the flesh, and that's the pursuit of it. And what James is saying is what Paul is saying is that if you just live by your own desires and you just left those unchecked, it's not going to produce anything good. Yes, that goes in violation against God's laws and uh, lawlessness. Uh, my definition of sin, and uh, pulling out from here as well, is that you know, sin is always going to be against God's commandments. And God has given us commandments even to reign in our flesh not to live that kind of lifestyle because he knows it's not going to produce anything good. If we'll submit to him, we will have the best life with him. Uh, so let's expand on this a little bit more. What does it mean to live in the flesh? Got a few passages up here to help illustrate it. Um, and we'll kind of take them in turn if you don't mind. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Somebody read there. And then um, if you're not there, go ahead and pick up the other passage and we'll read all of those out loud. And as we're reading, take note of the characteristics of living in the flesh, okay? Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Okay. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the words of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, robberies, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. For do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, <coughs> nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. In Colossians 3, 5 through 10. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, for fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is adultery. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, <coughs> in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. But now you are you yourselves are put to put all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So if you look through these verses, um, a person like Ephesians chapter two, one through three, and he gives us characteristic of what it looks like living in the flesh. He said you're at odds with God, but your God is the God of this world. That's what that looks like. The God of this world is Satan. He has started the ball rolling from the very beginning. We have found him there as the tempter, as the adversary, uh, prowling around like a roaring lion. That's the life, that's the kingdom that we had lived in. But he says, such were some of you, is what Paul says in Corinthians. But he also says the same thing in verse 4, Ephesians 2, verse 4, but God. And he tells us the opposite side of this. this is what it looks like being in God. But living in that kind of uh, life, if you look back on that, is it just thinking about where you came from, uh, if you were brought up in the church, brought up around Christianity, brought up around good things and a good family, I dare say there are still things that we look back on and it makes our stomach sink or turn to think, it's not really what I used to do. That's what I did. And if we dwell on that too long, it can start bringing up things in our mind. But if we get this whole balance, and such were some of you, as Paul says in Corinthians, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, that old man is done, 
You don't live in the kingdom of unrighteousness. You're not opposed to God. You are now with God. Cast off. And pursue God. That should bring great joy to our life. Where we can say, all right, that's behind me. Not just take a glancing look back to, no, that is really done. It is a way. Um, but then you also have those laundry list of verses, I mean, of sins that come out in here, of all the things that characterize what that life used to be. And, I mean, you could go through there and think, okay, um, yeah, I used to do that. I'm not doing that anymore. But then there's also that of, hmm, have I, have I failed here? Have I, have I started something here? I want to pursue something more. We should be able to look back on that and be able to grow from there. So uh, good verses to go along with this if you're making a cross-reference uh, potentially. But then we get a definition of sin. Sin is a violation or a transgression or a considered lawlessness. So remember, we have the characteristic of a law. Sin is going against God's law. And that's what 1 John 3, 4 through 10 talks about. Um, let's go there. I'm going to uh, read a couple of things from this passage. 1 John 3, starting in verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning. By this it is evident the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who uh, does not love his brother. I mean, you can find multiple verses, just about in every single book, that just brings this up of if you are pursuing righteousness, remember we're in the section on righteousness, you don't make a practice of sinning. He's not, in, in his language may be confusing here to think about you will never sin. It's not that kind of what some of our religious friends want to take with that of, you know, once saved, always saved, and things along those lines. That's not what's coming out in these passages at all. But that is not your priority. That is not, you don't want to be labeled as a sinner you are walking in the light, and you may make bad decisions, but as long as you are walking in the light, the blood of Christ will be with you and cleanse you. But if you walk away and you go into the darkness, you go back to that old lifestyle, he says the sacrifice of sin no longer remains. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36, around in there. So be careful how you walk. Understand how sin operates and how you are changed from that. So flesh and spirit are opposed to each other. I want to have the mind of God. I don't want to have the mind of flesh anymore. Uh, I want to get away from that. This is what Paul is talking about back in Romans chapter 7. And I knew as we got caught up in this, it would uh, end this way. But um, as we go back to Romans chapter 7, uh, in verse 11, he says, For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. It's not that God's laws are bad. That was never it from the beginning. The commandments were never wrong at any point. The wrong part is seeing those commandments and saying, I'm not going to do them. Challenging God, thinking that we know better versus God. The commandments have never been wrong. It's our view of them that's the issue. And so we have to, we have to be able to deal with that. And this is where you come out in um, Romans chapter 8. And we may, we'll bring out a couple of things here, and then we may get to a couple of weeks, and I'll work with Brian on his topic, what he's going to do next week. Um, but I like what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 2. So this is that balance that we're dealing with here. Focus on where our mind is now in Christ. All right, we ready? Um, somebody pick up in Romans 8, start reading verse 2 and go through 8. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. <coughs> For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sin and flesh and for sin, 
he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, we walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to, the <clears throat> for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on flesh is hostile to God, but it does not submit to God's, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is what Paul's trying to tell us. And this is why we're calling it a paradigm shift. Going from what the flesh has to offer in this continual battle that we have with our desires. If we change our focus, and, and um, Paul will say in Colossians 3, starting in verse 1, set your mind on things that are above. If we keep keeping our focus down here on things of the world, things of the past, those are done. We count those as rubbish, right, is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. All things, putting all that, calling it rubbish in comparison to Christ. I know this is a bigger chunk, and this is where he gets kind of confusing his language, but this is where we're getting that flesh and spirit uh, dynamic, the same way we talked about works and all these kind of things beforehand. But look at where our focus is. Um, Jesus coming saw what happened with the law. God's law is good. It has always been that way. But because of our weakness of flesh, desiring our own things, we were not able to fulfill the law. One of the things that God says in Deuteronomy, he says, these things are not too far from that you cannot follow them. They're not too difficult for you that you can't do them. They are in your hearts and your minds. He said they're right here in front of you if you would just listen. And it's, all, it's always been a heart issue. And if man's heart has not been directed to God, we're not going to do his commandments. And that's why Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to uh, contradict it in any way, but by showing you're just focused on the letter of the law. You're thinking about murder, but are you thinking about anger? Are you thinking about tearing people down? You're focused on the adultery, just the, the act itself, but are you lusting? And he just... This, he said, no, you got to have the heart in it. Just because somebody says, don't go there, don't taste that, don't touch that, don't eat that, you think that's going to fix the problem, but it doesn't unless your heart is where it needs to be. And you're going to say, okay, if God says don't eat that, well, I'm not going to eat it. That's just, I, I can work through it. And then as you go along, God reveals this a little bit more. But Jesus taking on flesh, the word of God in flesh. God saying, here's what I've told you. Here's my word from the very beginning that I brought into exist, you know, all things into existence. And now you see it lived in front of you. That's the path you should be pursuing in Jesus. If the law, if God's commandments, God's word, if Jesus enshrouds that in flesh and he says, walk with me and I'll walk for you, you just got to be where I am, he fulfills the law. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Paul tells us, have the mind of God, live as God have intended for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God and it uh, does not submit to God's law indeed it cannot if you're in the flesh you can't please God so how can we think more like God we want to focus on his spirit and so I'm going to punt that to two weeks unless uh, Brian wants to jump in on that next week um, but I kind of figured it would go that way so appreciate you guys thanks for being here and diving into this